From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful word that you've given us today. Please bless Pastor Matthew as he reaches us all uh, with your word today. Let us hear it and receive it and remember it. Amen. Amen. All right, you may have a seat. Well, hey, you find yourself in the next week of our sermon series called First Things First. And what we like to do at the beginning of every year is kind of like a, a back to basics. I remember when I was uh, playing hockey as a kid, um, that w- at the beginning of the season, one of the first things they do is like, hey, this is a puck. And whoever puts their puck in the opponent's goal more often, they win a game. It's like back to basics. Like, okay, that's how you play hockey. I'm sorry, I should have made a hockey joke in Arizona. You're all like, hockey? What's that? <laughs> From Colorado, y'all. Um, But hey, so we've been asking fundamental questions. Questions like, what is the gospel? We started with that, and we said the gospel is simply Jesus in my place for my sins. And then last week we said, okay, those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, they hear that good news of the gospel, they repent of their sins and put their faith in him, they're called Christians. But then we asked the question, so what does a Christian do? And last week we said that what a Christian does, the disciplines of their faith are prayer, Bible, church. We talked about the ear of God, the word of God, as the people of God. And so today, the question that I want to ask is, okay, maybe you've heard the gospel, you repented of your sins, put your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe now the question is, how should I see myself, or how should I perceive of myself? And what does that even mean? Because the idea of perceiving myself, we all kind of view ourselves through our own lens. But those of us who are Christians who have repented of our sins and put our faith in Jesus— We are to see ourselves through Christ's lens, through his sacrifice. And so I want us to see ourselves through Christ. But what does that mean? That's what I want to answer for us today. And here's my big idea. We are called to live by Christ, in Christ, and for Christ. That's what we're going to get done today. We're going to live by Christ, in Christ, and for Christ. And we're going to use today's text to look at that. And I want to kind of just jump right in to verse 16. It says, from now on, therefore... We regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. That's a lot of weird kind of way of saying that, hey, we don't really view things in terms of life and death here on earth. We once viewed Jesus as a man, but we now don't regard him as this because we realize Jesus is so much bigger than just a man. Which brings me to my first point. By Christ, the way we see the world changes. By Christ, the way that we see the world changes. Um, I don't know if you uh, have ever watched the movie The Matrix. If you have, um, you will remember this iconic scene where some, the guy goes up to Keanu Reeves and he says, you can take this pill and you'll go back to your life. You'll forget everything I've shown you. But if you take this pill, you'll see the world in an entirely different way. I have a buddy who is adamant that The Matrix is just the gospel told through the lens of Keanu Reeves. I, I'm not sure if that's true. <laughs> Regardless, this illustration's good. Uh, And so the guy chooses the pill that will let him know everything. When Paul became a Christian, the author of this text, when he became a Christian, he said it was like scales fell off his eyes and he was able to see. In the same way, when we repent of our sins and put our faith in Jesus Christ, we recognize that there's so much more going on than what the world shows us. See, the world would want us to believe, apart from Christ, that everything is just some product of chance, just a happenstance. But we know in Christ that the world and everything isn't just some product of chance. It was all beautifully and wonderfully crafted by God to reveal his glory and his goodness. And everything that exists was created for that purpose, to worship God, to glorify God. That means the things that we possess, the relationships that we have, everything in this world was meant to reveal that God is good and awesome and powerful. 
And where we find brokenness in this world, where we find bits of where, hey, that doesn't work, that's not a good thing, things like cancer or infertility or death or sickness, when we see those things, it's a byproduct of the brokenness of man, flesh, sin, And all those things were not the way that God created it to be, but because of Adam and Eve's first sin that brought sin into this world, and now we're all born into sin. So often when you see flesh in the Bible, it's talking about our sinful nature. And so where we find brokenness, we recognize that that's a byproduct of the brokenness of man. Yet praise God, he loved us so much, he sent Jesus to put on human flesh, to live a life that we could not live, and then die a death that we deserve so that we can be reconciled to God. And when Jesus comes again at his second coming, he will rid the world of all the brokenness and all the death and all the disease and all that, and all will glorify God the way it was intended to be. But this idea of Jesus taking on flesh and becoming a perfect sacrifice for our sins is the gospel. Jesus in my place for my sins. And when we interact with that, we start to see the world through gospel potential. It's like the scales have fallen off our eyes and we recognize That this isn't just something that's happening where we're supposed to live and die and it doesn't really matter. We recognize that no, it totally matters in terms of eternity. In fact, gospel potential changes the way that we see other people. To live by Christ means that we see people differently. Because I want to tell you, there's only two kinds of people. I like to make this joke often, that there's either Broncos fans or those who are wrong. But those are not the two kinds of people I'm talking about today. There's two kinds of people. There's the people who are either a redeemed sinner or a sinner in desperate need of redemption. Those are the only two people. You're either a sinner redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ or you're a sinner who's in desperate need of that redemption. And we start to see people this way, that it's less about the flesh and more about the soul for us and everyone around us. When you look around now, you don't just go like, oh, that guy's a plumber. Oh, that guy's a cop. Oh, that guy's a fireman. No, it's not like that. We say, hey, that person is either a child of God or I need to help them become a child of God. By Christ, it changes the way we see the world. We no longer walk around in the flesh, but rather keep one foot in this world and one foot in eternity. One foot in kingdom come. The Bible says that when we put our faith in Jesus, we become citizens of heaven. So this is only our temporary dwelling. And while we're here, we're to, be, we're to see the world differently. By Christ, we see a whole new world beyond what we can see and touch. We were not designed to just live and die and somewhere in the middle try to be healthy, wealthy, and thriving. God designed us for something so much better than that. But also, with the scales falling off our eyes figuratively, kind of we took the pill where we get to see the world for what it really is, we recognize that everything was created for the glory of God. That's the way it was designed. But we also recognize that we have a real enemy. The Bible says the enemy prowls around like a lion waiting to devour something. So in this life that not only is everything supposed to glorify God, but there's this enemy that wants to take that away from us. But also, when we see the world for what it really is, we recognize that we have a real hope in Jesus. That yes, there's this enemy. Yes, there's darkness. But praise God, he sent Jesus to die in our place for our sins in response to that sin and brokenness, so that if we are in him, this life is not the best life that there is. The life to come is. So in light of that, we see everything and everyone in this world as something created to bring God glory. And by Christ, we have awoken from the slumber of our passivity to recognize that sin put us in darkness Yet by Jesus Christ, we are resurrected from that. We are no longer slaves to that, and we get to see the world differently. Paul then goes on to say in verse 17, it's probably one of my favorite verses, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Here's my next point. In Christ, the way we relate to the things in this world changes. In Christ, the way we relate to the things, we relate to things differently. I told you before, by Christ we see the world differently, but I also see the way we interact with things in the world changes when we are in Christ. 
particularly in four areas. How we relate to God, how we relate to others, how we relate to the world, and how we relate to our sin. And the way I want to tackle each of those four categories is by honing in on that phrase where it says, all of this is from God. Because of God, something has changed in us. Because God loved us enough to send His Son, because God is glorious, and all those things, it's because of God's nature that we have been reconciled to Him. And so I want to look at four attributes of God that help dictate for us the way that we relate to the world. The first one is this, God is great, so we don't have to be in control. When I say that God is great, what I mean is, in contrast to small, God is so much bigger than our world. God is so much bigger than our problems. God is so much bigger than our anxieties. I want to tell you something you probably already know. Control is overrated. Yet we all desire to have it, right? We all like, no, I need to be in control. It's just better. I'm one of those weirdos that I like to um, be the only person who drives. Uh, So one time Noah and I had to go on a road trip to New Mexico, and he drives a Toyota Corolla, and I drive a GMC 1500 drastically different gas mileages. And Noah's like, hey, it just would be more sensical if we took my car. I said, that may be true, but I like to drive. And he said, so you're going to make me let you drive my car? I said, if you want to take your car. (laughs) And so it was probably weird. You should talk to Noah about it. He will tell you that that was probably a weird experience to be the passenger in his own car all the way to Las Cruces. Control is overrated, though. In reality of things, we don't have to be in control because God is ultimately in control. And because we know that God is great, and we know he really is, right, from the vastness of the universe to the intimacy of the human cell, God God created all of that. Do you know that if even like one small piece of your body is off, we don't live. But God designed it perfectly to work together. And if he can handle that, If he can speak that into existence and keep it all going, if he can get the world to revolve around the sun the way it does, man, he can bring control to our chaos. We don't have to be in control. And because we are in Christ, because we put our trust in him, we get to trust God. Regardless of what comes, we get to be stable and steadfast because we know that no matter what, God is great and ultimately he is in control. And he won't forget about us. That's the thing. We don't have a God who's absent from our lives. He's actively at work in our lives. And what I, the thing that you need to know in your desire for control is that in your desire for that control, you're robbing yourself of the peace that is found when we trust in him. So the first thing I want you to see is that in Christ, we relate to God differently than the rest of the world. And one of the ways that we relate differently to him is that we get to trust him and recognize that he's in control. In the midst of the storms of your life, you get to say, I trust God. And the world won't recognize how that's possible, but you get to go, I just trust him. The next thing I want us to look at is that God is glorious. We don't have to impress others. God is glorious. We don't have to impress others. I I love to tell this story every time I talk about the gloriousness of God. But I have a buddy, he also planted a church down in Queen Creek. And he's a basketball player. And one time he was at a basketball camp when he was in college, and Michael Jordan happened to be there. And my buddy put up a jump shot, and afterwards Michael Jordan said, hey, that was a nice jump shot. The fact that Michael Jordan, who is arguably the best basketball player of all time, told him he had a nice jump shot, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of his jump shot. If you could be like, hey, I think he had a crappy jump shot. Well, maybe. But, Jesus, or, but Michael, Michael Jordan thought it was good. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead of myself. In the same way, look at Colossians 1 with me. Colossians 1 says, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. What that means is that God, through Jesus Christ, says this about you. You are holy, you are blameless, and you are above reproach. It does not matter what the rest of the world says about you. Because God, the creator of all things, says that if you are in him, you are holy, blameless, and above reproach. That's like Michael Jordan saying, you have a nice jump shot. It does not matter what anybody else thinks about it. 
God the Father, because of Jesus, says that you are holy and blameless. You are righteous. You are a child of God. You don't need anybody else's approval. Your heavenly Father loves you. He has brought you close to him, and he says that you are his. So I want to free you from the need of approval. You don't need the approval of your parents. You don't need the approval of your boss, of your pastor, or anyone God gets to dictate who you are, and he says that you are his child, holy and blameless. So for those who have repented of their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have to impress others because Christ's perfect identity has been impressed on you. So God sees you as his son like he does Jesus. So because we are in Christ, we relate to others in a way where we don't have to impress them. We get to say, no, I'm a child of God first and foremost. So what you think of me or say about me is inconsequential in the, in, in the span of eternity. The third, the third attribute of God is this, that God is good. We don't have to look elsewhere. If God created everything for his goodness and his glory to reveal his majesty, then the things that we find goodness in in this world is actually just a small piece of how good God is. I'll tell you, there's a I have a favorite hike I like to do when I go back to Colorado. It's a hike called Uzo Falls. Um, for whatever reason, when I get there, I look up, there's this falls, and it trickles down this beautiful valley, and it's just gorgeous. And every time I see it, I'm just like, holy cow, I've taken pictures with my phone, and people think that I've stolen the picture off, like, a, a database and made it my background. They go, man, like a professional photographer took that. And I said, no, a dumb photographer took that, and it's just that good. And to me, that beauty of that creation was only to reveal how beautiful and glorious God is. In Christ, we relate to the things of this world differently. If we're honest, we all are searching for the good life. Everybody wants the good life. And maybe you've thought that the good life was going to be in your job. Maybe you have the ideal job that you always wanted and you were hoping that that would give you the good life. Or maybe you thought your kids were going to give you the good life or your finances, or really anything in this world. Sometimes we say, if I just had blank, well, then I would have the good life. But I'm willing to bet if that's you, that you're still waiting on the good life. I bet you don't feel like you've achieved it. Because trusting in God and living from your new identity as a child of God is the good life. That is the good life. The things of this world will let you down. Listen, if you put all your eggs in the basket of like, once I'm a spouse, I'm going to have the good life, you're going to find out quickly that your spouse will let you down. They can't be your God. They weren't created to be. And they're, sin, they're sinful and broken just like you. The same way if you put your hope in your kids, your kids are going to let you down. Your job, everything in this world will let you down because you weren't meant to worship it. You were meant to worship God. But rather, because of God's goodness, we get to see the things in this world as ways to fuel our worship for God's goodness. If you are blessed with a spouse, praise God, he, you got to see a piece of his goodness. Proverbs says, a man who finds a good wife finds a good thing, a gift from God. If you have children, that is a gift from God. If you have a good job, that is a gift of God. In all of it, we are to fuel our worship because of God's provision in our life. He is good. We don't have to look elsewhere. You don't have to search for the good life anymore because it's found in him. The last attribute I want to look at is this, that God is gracious. We don't have to prove ourselves. God is gracious. We don't have to prove ourselves. In Christ, the way we, re we relate to our sin changes. The world would tell you that if you make a mistake, do everything in your power to cover it up. Don't let anybody know that your brokenness and your wrongdoings, that's your business. But the hard truth is, you are sinful, and you can go ahead and stop trying to prove that you're not. You can stop trying to prove to anybody that you're not broken. The freedom I want to give to you is that if you are in Christ, if you have repented of your sins, put your faith in Him, you don't have to be afraid of the sins that you've committed. You don't have to be afraid of them. You don't have to hide your broken life or your sins. In fact, I would argue that nothing good grows in the dark. 
If you go inside a cave, there's nothing good growing in there. There's bats and fungus, and it's not good. Nothing good grows in the dark. So when we bring our sin into the light, you will find that Jesus has already paid for them. You will find that if you repented of those sins, Jesus already covered those. You don't have to be afraid of them. I've recently started praying when I pray for people. God, would you give them a flashlight to their soul that they could find sin and repent of it? That they would be able to search it out and so that they can repent of it and get rid of it. In Community Life Church, we will celebrate repentance, not moralism. I'm not looking to have a church full of people who always get it right. I'm looking for a church filled with people who, when they get it wrong, repent and turn back to Jesus. I want you to get really good at confessing and repenting, not only to God, to other people as well, but at least to God. At least be able to say, hey, I totally messed up, God. I, will you take me back? And the answer is always yes. Absolutely. In fact, what we find is the more we wander from God, even when we turn back, he's right there. It's not an uphill climb back to Jesus. He's with you the whole time. The more that you can live broken, not hiding your sin, just admitting who you are. Paul says, I am what I am. The more you can live that way, the less broken you will feel. It's only when we carry the weight of our sin and brokenness that we feel broken. But if you can confess your sin and walk in the freedom of Jesus Christ, you will feel less broken because you're not trying to prove something. But if you are trying to constantly prove that you are not broken, you are not only wasting your time, you're going to fail. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all stumbled into brokenness. If you wanted to find brokenness in my life, it's not that hard. You could search my life and you will find sin and brokenness in my life. So we could stop trying to prove that we're not. Rather, I would encourage you to prove the goodness and graciousness of God by walking in truth. To say, oh, I'm totally broken. I'm totally sinful. Yet Jesus Christ died in my place for my sins and I am now a child of God. Because you are either a redeemed sinner or a sinner in desperate need of redemption. Those are the only two possibilities. So in Christ, we relate to our sin, not as something that has power over us, but rather something that has been paid for by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So in Christ, we relate to the things of this world differently. We relate to God differently. We relate to people differently, to the things of this world, and to sin differently, because we are in Christ. We have a new identity. Paul goes on to say in verse 19, that is, and so we have to back up and say, what is he talking about? He says, and he also gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. And so you want to know, hey, well, Matthew, what do you mean by reconciliation? It's simply this, not counting their trespasses, trespasses against them. And in doing so, he entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Here's my third point. For Christ, our purpose in the world changes. By Christ, we see the world differently. In Christ, we relate to the world differently. And for Christ, our purposes change. In Christ, we get to see that there's so much more to life than the things the world says matter. That blank that I gave you a little bit ago when we said all you need is blank and then you'd be happy. The world wants you to believe that to be true. And the world would say whatever that blank is, that's your purpose in life. Go get that thing. That's your purpose. That's what you need to do. The world wants you to think that you need to be healthy, wealthy, and thriving and anything short of that is a failure. I want to tell you that's not true. If we believe that, it becomes our purpose. But in Christ, our purpose has totally been changed. In fact, what you find is the more you walk with Jesus, the less the things the world says matters, matters to you. We don't live with the purpose to be healthy, wealthy, and thriving in this life. 
Rather, because of our new identity with Christ, we get to live in a way that sets us up for success in eternity rather than in this life. We live our lives understanding our gospel expectation. It says, Paul says in this text that our reconciliation came with God entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. What's the message of reconciliation? Well, that's the gospel. Jesus in my place for my sins. And to receive that reconciliation comes with the expectation that you would take it and share it with others. God chooses to use us in this way to see other people come to believe. It's funny, at the end of that video that we saw earlier this morning, there was that text from Romans 10. It's this text right here. It says this in verse 13. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, praise the Lord. All you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. But then Paul asks this question. But how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. God could have chosen any means possible to declare the gospel to the world that desperately needs it. He could have wrote it in the clouds. He could have used a megaphone from heaven. But what he chooses to do is use the redeemed to help bring sinners to redemption. What he chooses to, you, to do is take people who are lost and broken in their sin, but changed by the blood of Jesus Christ to take the good news of the gospel to a world that desperately needs it. To receive the grace of God. To receive the forgiveness, the reconciliation of God. But to, but to say, I'm not going to give that to somebody else, is to receive the grace of God in vain. The only way that you came to believe is because somebody helped you get there. And you might be thinking, well, maybe I was just reading my Bible and I came to believe. Well, where did your Bible come from? Somewhere along the way, somebody had a hand in you coming to believe. God could have used any means that he wanted to to communicate the gospel, but he chooses to use those who've been reconciled to encourage and lead others to the same reconciliation. So what does that mean for us? Well, we actually flip the, the world on its head. The world says you need certain things. You need prosperity, health, and wealth, and all these things. And we get to say, no, those are tools I get to use. Our time, talents, and treasure are just tools to be put to work for eternal things, not worldly things to possess and use for our, for our own gain. At the end of every service here at Community Life Church, whoever does the closing announcements ends with, Community Life Church, you are sent. That may seem like a silly thing. In fact, a lot of people know that we're going to say it, so sometimes they say it with me, or whoever else is going to say it. But I want you to know, it's not just words that we say just to say it, so we can say you're dismissed. Every week, I want the church to commission you back into a world that desperately needs the hope of the gospel. It is the purpose that we have for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus. I want you to live sent. What I mean by that is when you go to work, I don't want you to go to work just thinking that you're checking in, making money. That's not what you're doing. You are an ambassador for Christ in your workplace. I don't want you just to go there and work. I want you to glorify God and be a light in the midst of darkness. When you go home after work, I don't want you to think that you're finally hitting your rest time. Like, oh good, I finally just get to kick back and relax. No, what you're doing is you get to go home and you get to be a missionary to your family. That when you get home, you get to display the gospel to your spouse, to your children, to whoever is going to be a guest in your home that day. You get to be a missionary in your home. You get to be a missionary in your community. When you go to the gym, I don't want you just to lift weights just to lift weights. Yeah, you should totally get strong. I encourage that. But while you're at the gym, be a missionary for the Lord. In fact, there's a Bible verse that says, Physical fitness is of some value, but eternal fi or spiritual fitness is of eternal value. In all aspects in our lives, we are to live for a purpose so much bigger than our own lives. I want you to leave here living sent. That in all things that you are doing, you can be an ambassador for Christ. What does that mean? Well, Paul says it impl we implore people, be reconciled to God. You have the cure for the malignancy of somebody's soul, the death inside somebody's soul, in the life of Jesus Christ. You only need to give it to him. 
every week I like to ask the question, what do I literally want you to do? Well, I want you to seize a drastically different life that was given to you by Jesus Christ. And I want you to live that life in Christ. I don't want you to live in control. I don't want you to try to impress somebody. I don't want you to try to prove yourself or look for goodness in this world. I want you to find all of that in Christ. And from there, I want you to take this life and I want you to live it for Christ. If you've been changed by Jesus Christ, I want you to boldly live for him. That is our purpose. To live as a redeemed sinner, helping sinners in desperate need of redemption come to know him. You might ask the question, Matthew, why would I do that? Well, verse 21 says this. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Why would we do it? Because God loved us so much, he didn't leave us in need. So we don't leave others in need. And I just want to say this, that if you are not a Christian, if, you were, if you've not put your faith in Jesus Christ, you and I and God all know that you are broken, that you are sinful. I also know that you have no answer for that brokenness. But praise be to God, Jesus does. Jesus died in your place for your sins. And he offers you a way to handle that sin debt. The way he does that is he says you acknowledge your sins. You confess them to him. You seek his forgiveness. And then you repent back to him. Repent means just to turn back to God. And if you will do that, if you will confess your sins, turn away from them, and follow Jesus, and walk in his newness of life, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away, and the new has come. If you will repent of your sins, put your faith in Jesus Christ today, that is your story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for this reality that by Christ, in Christ, and for Christ, our worldview has drastically changed when we put our faith and trust in him. And God, I pray that you would move in the midst of Community Life Church. Let us not be unfazed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let nobody leave here unchanged or unmoved by your goodness and your glory. God, I want the scales to fall off the eyes of everybody in this room and that they see I am more than the sum of all my successes and failures. I'm created by God for God. And in Jesus Christ, I'm a child of God. And God, if there's somebody here today that that's not their story yet, I pray you would move in their heart that you would lead them right where they are to admit, God, I know I'm totally a sinner. I know I'm totally broken. I don't know what to do with my brokenness. Will you forgive me? And God, I know that you will. And that if they will walk with you, God, they will find the good life. I pray that for everybody in this room. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.